the title of my talk is Don't Be Deceived. And I will talk with you today about the Antichrist, not because I really want to, but because the Lord has given us information in his word. And apparently there are things that he wants us to know about the Antichrist so that we won't be deceived. There is a lot of information. So I will share with you characteristics of the Antichrist personality. This list and statements that I will make, I got out of Mark Hitchcock's book, which is the complete book of Bible prophecy. Look how little it is. It's the complete book. <laughs> but it's such an easy book to use. It's full of lists. And he actually just gives the list. Not much explanation. I will try to give a little bit more explanation. If you are very interested in end times Bible prophecy, I'll go back and recommend this book. <laughs> it's very thorough. And Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, I'll be using this book and referring to him. And I've quoted him in the Micah study. So, um, Ed Heinsohn, Tim LaHaye, what I'm sharing with you is repeated by these people as well in their end times studies books. Well, let's get started. Number one, the Antichrist will be an intellectual genius, an intellectual genius. Daniel 8, 23 says, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles shall arise. So other Bible translations say one who understands riddles. He's skilled in intrigue. He understands dark sentences. He's a master of intrigue. He understands sinister schemes. So this is telling us that he has a sharp mind. He is a smart man, even though it's all about evil. He's an intellectual genius. Number two, the Antichrist will be an oratorical genius. He speaks well. This is oratory. He's an oratorical genius. Daniel 7, 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth, so we're concentrating on his speaking, speaking great things. He boasts, he speaks arrogantly, and even as he does this, he speaks eloquently. He causes people to follow him. They believe what he's saying. They are not offended. He's an excellent public speaker. So he is an oratorical genius. Daniel 11:36 on your handout says, the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. So he speaks astonishing things, outrageous things against God. Other translations, monstrous things against the God of gods, presumptuous things against the God of gods. He does this and he gets away with it. People want to hear him say this. That shows the, the wickedness of their hearts, the rejection of God that is among the people, and the deception that he is speaking with. So that's blasphemy that he is carrying out. He's an oratorical genius. Number three, he will be a political genius. Daniel 8, 23, looked at this a little bit ago, but it just refers to a king of bold face who shall arise. He's going to come up in political power. Revelation 17, 12, and 13 says, the 10 horns that you saw on the beast are 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. So what we see is the Antichrist taking political power away from world leaders. He's taking it away, but they're handing it over. Mm -hmm. 
He's a political genius. He knows the right buttons to push. He knows the spin. He's deceiving. He is, um, he's powerful. Number four, he will be a commercial genius. You could say he's a brilliant businessman. And that's not intended to be a compliment, but just he is excellent in business. He has that savvy. Daniel 11, 43 through 45. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. This is a little side note. Verse 44. News from the east and the north shall alarm him and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. Verse 45. He shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. That's good news. But we're actually looking at the fact that he has palatial tents. He is a rich man. World commerce is making money and it's flowing into his pockets. <laughs> he is living the lifestyles of the rich and famous in these palatial tents. He's got the power. He's got the money. In Revelation 13, 16 through 18, it causes all. In Revelation, it's referring back to the beast. The beast in Revelation is the Antichrist. The Antichrist causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy sell unless he has the mark, the name of the beast or the number of its name. So all business is associated with this man, with the Antichrist. Again, this, and this money is going to be in his hand. Number five, he will be a military genius. Revelation 6, 1 says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. So this is the first seal that we're looking at. I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Now, it's usually the good guys who ride in on the white horses, right? Prince Charming riding in on the white. This is not Prince Charming, but he is trying to fake people out. He comes in on a white horse, and its rider had a bow. Now, a bow and arrow is a weapon. He's only coming with the bow. It doesn't say he's coming with the bow and arrow. Only the bow. So this is indicating that he is coming in peace. But the next thing that it says is a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. So he shows up like, oh, hey, I'm a peaceful guy. But boom, he's coming. He's conquering and to conquer. This shows his military ability. And if it's not him like doing the actual, I'm shooting right now, <laughs> or pulling the bow. If he's not the one on the battlefield, he is leading the armies, he is empowering the armies to destroy. Uh, Revelation 16, 12 through 14 is the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Just pause. You might have mentioned this in your group. I don't know. But you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the three. This is the unholy trinity. This is the counterfeit trinity. The true trinity is God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. So the way Satan is counterfeiting things, unholy trinity, dragon, beast, false prophet. So Satan, antichrist, false prophet. Um, all right, verse 14. They are demonic spirits, these unclean spirits like frogs. They are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So out of the mouth of the beast comes this unclean spirit that is prompting the kings of the whole world to assemble. So the Antichrist is directing through the power of Satan, 
through demonic forces, to come to Israel, to the plain of Megiddo, or the, a space in Israel, and they're being assembled for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Through demonic forces, the Antichrist is causing world leaders to gather. They're gathering for Armageddon. They're gathering to fight against God, against Jesus. I've been saying, as the list says, um, that the Antichrist is a genius, but he's a fool. Gathering kings, armies, the armies of the kings, the armies of the world, to fight against Jesus, to fight against God? He, he, does he not know he's going to lose? Well, he's deceived. He's a deceiver and he's deceiving himself. All right, the next one, number six. He will be a religious genius. But his religion is all about himself. And he's causing all to worship him. So he will have this religious thing going on. But it is not true <laughs> religion. Daniel 11:37 He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god for he shall magnify himself above all. There you have it. He sees himself as god. We see that we see that in 2 Thessalonians 2:4. The antichrist is the one who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called god or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Through deception, through his eloquent speaking, through his power, through his oppression, he is causing people to worship him. In Revelation 13, we see another way that he is commanding worship, and it's through a counterfeit resurrection. Everything he's doing is counterfeit. Revelation 13, 3, one of its heads, one of the beast's heads, seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. You have to pay attention to the little words in this verse. It seemed as if it had a mortal wound. It didn't. This is fake. He is faking his death. He is faking a resurrection. But the world is going to marvel. This is an illusion. And they worshipped the dragon, that's Satan, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, the Antichrist, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Let's see, skip to verse 7 in that passage. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it, authority was given to the beast over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everybody on earth will worship the Antichrist except everyone whose name has not been written. I'm sorry, I'm not saying it right. All who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb that was slain. So those whose names are written in the book of life will not worship the beast. These would be 144,000 of the tribes of Israel who have been sealed and those who are responding to the gospel, obeying the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is repent, repent, and you will be saved. So the Antichrist creates a new world religion where he is the focus of all worship. What else about this man? He will be a Gentile. It shouldn't surprise you that this is another thing that is debated. There are so many things regarding end times that there is a little bit of controversy, a little bit of debate about. Some do think that he is a Jew. And if you look at on your handout under number six, Daniel 11:37. The reason some think that the Antichrist is a Jew is because they read this verse from Daniel 11:37 as he shall pay no attention to the God of his fathers, like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God, capital G. 
but it actually is plural in the original language. So he pays no attention to the gods of his fathers. That's not going to be a Jew, paying attention to gods, plural. There are a few other things that would lead us to think that this Antichrist is a Gentile. The verse on your handout is Revelation 13, 1. I saw a beast rising out of the sea. And the sea is actually the key right there. The sea is symbolically often representing Gentile nations. So, beast rising out of the sea, rising out of Gentile nations. I will mention a little bit more, if, hoping I have time to, that the examples of Antichrist that we have seen in history have also been Gentiles. And there's one specific one mentioned in Scripture, Antiochus Epiphanes, or, um, who was a Greek. And so that's one more thing that leads us to think that he's a Gentile. Number eight also gives us some information that makes us think that he is a Gentile. He will emerge from a, all right, my notes, what I have to say is a reunited Roman Empire. But there's a little bit of debate about that. Is, is um, a reunited empire that you could just put reunited empire, but if what I'm going to say is, uh, and, uh, well, I think it's going to, he's going to come from a reunited Roman Empire. That's where I am right now, but I am being exposed to the possibility that he's rising up out of the Islamic Empire. So I am aware of that perspective. Um, how do we determine whether he is Roman or Islamic? Daniel 9, 26 and 27 is not on your handout, but it says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So this is Daniel way back before the time of Jesus, 500s BC, and he's prophesying the people of the prince that shall come, and the prince that shall come is the Antichrist. So the people of the Antichrist shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that is looking ahead to, um, well, we have in history 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed. Jerusalem is going to be attacked in the future under the Antichrist, but Rome conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD. But those who would give some history and perspective that this Antichrist is Islamic or Muslim, look at the actual people, the ethnicity of those who did the destructing under the power of the Romans. So the Roman general said, go sack the city, go tear down the temple, go burn. And who went? people who have now Muslim descendants, Muslim ancestors, that ethnicity. So they look at those being the people. And I've seen it traced through time of how the empire that could be the one that the Antichrist is coming out of is the Islamic empire as it's taking over, a f the fourth beast with iron teeth. And that's the um, verse that's on your handout, Daniel 7, 7 through 8. Um, it says, I, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns. Behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Uh, so we read those others. So this fourth beast, who's the fourth beast? It has been seen as the Roman Empire for a while, and now there is also the possibility that it is the Islamic Empire. I don't know. We will see from heaven who this is and what, who his people are. You have on your handout Activities associated with the Antichrist, and I've given you a list of 26. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to point out a couple of them to you. Number two, 
His manifestation will signal the beginning of the day of the Lord and that time of the outpouring of God's wrath, the day of the Lord, the bad part of the day of the Lord. When the Antichrist is revealed, when he comes on the scene, that's when the day of the Lord is going to be happening. That's what Paul was trying to get across to the Thessalonians. It's not here yet. This hadn't happened yet. You'll see this man of lawlessness. He will be revealed. Not you, <laughs> not you believers, but those in the time will, um, on the earth will see him. Number four, his rise to power will come through peace programs. That's in a way how he's revealed. He will make a covenant of peace with Israel. This event will signal the beginning of the seven year tribulation. He will later break that covenant at its midpoint. I believe that rapture is coming first. I do not believe I'm going to be here to see that peace treaty signed. But if I see Israel sign a seven year peace treaty with a man and they start building the temple, then I will think like rapture is going to happen really soon <laughs> or this timeline that I've been teaching y'all is not the way it's going to happen. <laughs> So that's pretty much what I'm looking for. Um, the, you know, if we're not right, if somebody else is right, then we're going to see some things. But I'm not expecting to see the Antichrist and that temple be built. I'm coming back for the beautiful temple that Jesus is going to oversee being built. Number 13 says he will mercilessly pursue and persecute the Jewish people. So this time of tribulation will be a terrible time for the Jewish people. And I want to point out number 18, the Antichrist will rule the world politically, religiously, and economically for three and a half years. So from the midpoint when he seats himself in the temple of God and he takes over the world, he will have been setting the stage and coming to power and moving everything in the first three and a half years and then in the middle Oh no, it is, I mean, you truly can say from the midpoint on all hell is about to break loose because he is going to carry it out on earth, empowered by Satan. Oh, it's horrible. Let's see the good news. Number 25, the Antichrist will fight against Christ when he returns to earth, when Jesus returns to earth. And he, the Antichrist, will suffer total defeat can't wait for that day. And he, number 26, he will be cast alive into the lake of fire. That is the victory of Jesus. I mentioned a little bit ago that uh, in history there have been some types of Antichrist, pictures of what the coming Antichrist would look like. Here are a few of them. Nimrod in Genesis 10 and 11, he established the first worldwide organized rebellion against God, and he was the first world, world ruler. Pharaoh of Egypt oppressed God's people and openly defied God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was boastful and proud. He erected an image that people had to worship, and he also destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. Now, I don't think Nebuchadnezzar himself was there. Uh, beaten it down, but his army burned the temple that Solomon had built. Antiochus Epiphanes was a Greek king in 167 BC who attacked Jerusalem, set up an image in the temple, and demanded worship. So he is the one that is the really the most iconic type of Antichrist. Alexander the Great was a mighty world conqueror, and he declared himself God. And the Roman Caesars ruled the world, and they promoted emperor worship. You must bow down to Caesar. It's very probable that Satan is always preparing someone to be the man that he's going to empower, the Antichrist. And he's doing it in every age because Satan doesn't know when his time is going to come. God's restraining the lawlessness. He's holding it back. 
but this lawless man will be revealed in his time. Could the Antichrist be alive right now? It could be, since we don't know God's timing. Could we recognize him? When you look at all the scripture, it, if you're looking at what his activities are once he's been revealed, then we think, yes, we could. But scriptures say he's going to rise to power from obscurity. He's going to be working his way up. He's called a little horn. So he is going to be deceiving and just, he's, he's going to surprise. He's going to, it's going to be a surprise when he comes on the scene and takes over. What else? All right. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and they will deceive many. Should you be on the lookout for the Antichrist? I don't think you need to be on the lookout for the Antichrist. But you need to be on the lookout for all the Antichrist. All who are anti-Christ, anti-Messiah, against him. And those who are intent on deceiving. And we saw in our homework, the truth is the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There are many false prophets and antichrists. I've given you in your handout a list. I'll come back to the um, one, two, three, four in a second. But watchman.org profiles. This comes from a ministry called Watchman Fellowship. James Walker is a man that has been here at our church many times. He is an ex-Mormon. So he's been on the inside of a cult and I'm so impressed with that man. He meets with Mormons all the time, Jehovah's Witnesses all the time, atheists. He has an atheist Christian book club. He discusses this stuff with those who do not believe. And he and his ministry have compiled many profiles of groups who are counterfeit. They are religious. They are cults. Uh, there are individuals here. Oprah Winfrey is on this list, just for example. So it's not a comprehensive list of false religions and deceivers, but this is available for you to go to online. I just want to mention a few names that are on here because you don't know by the name of someone whether they are a Christian, Bible-believing group or not. Here's something called the Christadelphians. Uh, well, you know, maybe that's a cute word, but it's not. It's on this list of uh, bad news. Uh, Freemasonry, they're not just sticking stones on top of each other. They're not Masons. Uh, Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen is on this list, Brian McLaren, these are a few names. Um, New Age Movement, please be very careful with anything that has to do with New Age. Um, there is this church. Um, Westboro Baptist Church. Well, hmm, how about that? Sounds like a nice Baptist church. It's not. And then there's another church that is the um, like Church of Free Thought, the North Northern Texas Church of Free Thought. I'm pretty sure this is an atheist group, and they've decided to call themselves a church because they wanted the community and fellowship that is associated with this word church. So, um, word of faith movement. Be very careful with those who are a part of that. What do cults do? On his website, not his, on this ministry website, there is an article that talks about patterns in the cults. So this is the last four things for your handout. <laughs> what do you need to be aware of? When you're just talking to someone, listen. Are they adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing something to do with our faith? Are they adding to the Word of God? This would be, um, they think they should add to it because it's just a good book. It's just moral ideas and stories, and so we can add to the Word of God. It's not even the Word of God. Or do they add to the Word of God because they say it contains mistakes and must be interpreted by an additional book? That's what the Book of Mormon is. They think you have to have that. Do they add to the Word of God because they 
say it's an accurate book, but only they have the accurate interpretation. If a group is exclusive, then you need to be very discerning about what they are promoting. Number two, subtracting from the deity or humanity of Christ. Are they making him less than God? Are they making him less than human? Jesus says, all God and all man. He's fully divine. He's fully flesh. So look for how they handle Jesus. And remember that they are going to talk about Jesus as, maybe they'll call him a miracle worker, call him a prophet, call him the son of God. They call him Christ. So they'll use Bible words. But what's their definition? What do they mean? Number three, multiplying the requirements for salvation is another pattern of cults. Multiplying requirements for salvation. They are adding something. I'm saying adding, but multiplication is an extended adding, right? Okay. <laughs> um, they're saying it's faith plus something else. So always listen out for that. And another pattern. Hiding the followers' loyalty. And this is the belief that it's impossible to serve God without belonging to that particular group or church. Watchman Fellowship Profile states that every cult has this particular idea. Everyone says, we're the ones who know. So they are exclusive. Well, that's how they draw you in and say, well, we've got all the answers. We're the only ones who've got the answers. Let's get some good news here. <laughs> Those who have taken refuge in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, will see and rejoice and glorify Him at His glorious appearing. So I want to share in closing what Daniel said. And this is going to put the, uh, the two, uh, the bad guy and the good guy, ne right next to each other. Daniel 7, 11 through 14. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. I continued watching in the night visions and I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Jesus deserves all of our worship. Satan is going to everything he's going to be doing is going to be faking people out. He doesn't deserve any thing that he gets because it's all fake. It's all an illusion. There's nothing real good about him. But Jesus, our Savior, our King, our brother, he's good. And his kingdom is going to be a kingdom of justice and mercy. And we will hear more about that next semester. Yes, that's going to be very exciting. <laughs>